grew up in a pretty privileged background. Uh, my father was a British citizen. Both my grandfathers were British. Both my grandmothers were uh, Nigerian. Uh, we lived pretty well until the war started. I was, what, eight, nine, nine years old at the time. Here was I, this privileged kid in, you know, before the war, who became, you know, someone who was barely making it eaten and whatever, but we strived to survive during that time. I've been through such ups and downs in my life that it, I think it has helped a lot I wouldn't wish any of the things I've been through on, on every, anybody. My ex-husband was, was a, an Air Force pilot who flew the president of Nigeria. And the next thing I know, he's, he's accused of a coup. And uh, I went through hell. And I had three little kids, one of them six months old. But I was able to survive that able to survive his going through uh, court marshalling and everything and of the of the 17 of them who were who were charged only five of them made it alive the rest of them were, were pulled out and killed but it has it has made me who I am because I know that no matter how bad things are I truly believe that God carries me through all of it and that God will see me through it, just like he's seen me through everything right from when I was eight years old till today. You know, learn from your experiences and get back up again. If you don't do that, then <laughs> you have no business being in business. I grew up in the town of Aguri and the Botanical Gardens was, was a treasure for us as we were growing up. Uh, this is where I used to study. When I wanted to get away from everybody, I would pack up my books under my arm, walk all the way up to the gardens, and I would spend all day reading. And I loved science and I loved literature at the same time. So anything at all, I would just keep reading and reading. So I, I studied pharmacy, did a master's in pharmaceutical chemistry there at the university. Then I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo, where I did uh, a PhD in medicinal chemistry. Uh, then I did a, a postdoc, postdoctoral studies at Yale, Yale University in synthetic organic chemistry. I worked for several years in the multinational pharmaceutical company uh, I was at Abbott Laboratories for uh, decades. You get older and you've gotten all you need. You've got your education, you've got the career, you've got everything. And, and the, the, the cycle in life is that you, you start saying, okay, how do I leave my mark? What can I do? What do I do to make a difference? Um, the idea of coming back to Ghana and establishing a pharmaceutical company had always been there. Always wanted to go back, come back to Ghana and do that. And the great thing too is that I met my wife along the way. We shared the same passion. We've come together. He's got all the discovery background. I've got the background in, in scaling up and getting into the market and seeing that it is marketed and so on. So when we came up with this idea, I said, there is nobody doing anything in active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturing. This is what we need to do. At one point, she just said, this is it. It's now or never. So I am leaving work. I'm going to go down. I'm going to go do all the feasibility studies that I required, all the environmental studies that I required, and I'm not going to look back. <laughs> and so that was that. So, you know, uh, more or less, she made up our mind. <laughs> where everybody said, absolutely not, you can't do this. You can't do this. Uh, it's just not possible. We don't have 
um, the infrastructure for it. You need to wait, you need to first of all start importing products from India and then you can build, but in this environment it is not possible. I always say there is nothing like impossible in my dictionary. The breakthrough, I think, I guess came through when um, a friend of ours, Herman Patel, who used to work with me at Abbott, told us, listen, it's not that much of a big deal. You don't need to build an Abbott. So come over to India, come and visit, and we'll sh I'll show you, I'll take you around. And for me, that visit in India really, truly crystallized it. It's, it was a long haul. We had written business plans, everything else. But when we went and saw the number of chemical and pharmaceutical companies and industries and people making do with very little, um, the standards may not be as high as we wanted it to be, but that encouraged us to say, yes, we can do it. Frankly, when we started, there was no money coming from any place. It was through our own resources. At that time, I thought, boy, that's a lot of money. I'm going to retire comfortably. <laughs> we had to decimate everything in order to get started. Frankly, here in Africa, nobody really takes you seriously until you've, you've started something, you've sunk some money into it, and you're fully committed. For all of these ventures, until you physically located or found a place, it doesn't really look real. But once you've identified a place like when now there was a building, there was property, it made everything real. You started feeling, yes, we've started, we better go on. So that was a, a real seminal moment uh, in the entire project. It was a clear objective right from the start that we were not going to do what everybody else was doing. It just was not an option. It never came up. There was no question of cutting corners. We had engineers who would tell us, oh, we could do it this way or we could try it this way. And we say, no, this is not what we, we're here to do. We're here to make a difference. They could also have come to Ghana and decided to go into distribution like everybody else and decided to follow the status quo import drugs from India or wherever, sell, make their money, and just go, like everybody else. But they decided to make the difference. We built it to be compliant with international standards of good manufacturing practices. That meant that um, access into the buildings and to parts of the building had to be controlled. So there is a magnetic card identifying everybody, the utilities separate from where the manufacturing is, from where the laboratories are, and so on. Such a way that you can say dirt or powders or things won't hide in any place. When I entered Lacre, I was actually working directly under Dr. Graham. Within the first three months, I realized that that place it's a different place, it's a different environment for someone who actually wants to develop a career in the field of pharmaceutical environment. You know, they are trying to empower you so that wherever you go, you'll be able to stand on your own. I had the opportunity to handle a whole range of equipment that back from school was like, hey, magic. And I thought that this is, this is historical. For the first time, there's a company that is bringing a paradigm shift in the way drugs are manufactured in Africa. I thought it's something I wanted to be part of. This makes us vertically integrated because we are starting right from the scratch, making our own raw material and then converting it into a finished dosage form. So this lab is mainly for API synthesis on a small scale. And I had a factory and tour, and wow. What a facility. I could imagine that could be built in Africa. So for those working in the capsule manufacturing area, you come in through here, you gown appropriately, and then you are ready. I was taken, God being so good. So I joined the company with the motivation to be part of 
such an industry which is starting all afresh. So that was the motivation. A pharmacist looking at something new, something extraordinary, a story that is going to be told, if not now, in the future, which I wanted my name to be part of that story. The biggest problem we have is, is infectious diseases in Africa. 15% of, of, of infant mortality in Ghana is from diarrhea. Why should diarrhea be killing our kids in, in 2013? You have poor people, they can't afford drugs, okay? You have sick people, they can't work, and so they become poor. So it's, it's, it's a cycle, that is, it's a vicious cycle that continues. If you don't tackle the healthcare problems, it doesn't matter how much microfinancing is done. If you, the people are not healthy, they can't work, they can't do businesses, they cannot do anything. The medicines are not even available. And even if they're available, they are beyond reach of the very people who are suffering from these diseases. So from the onset of LaGre, tackling or creating solutions for African problems was very ideal. Counterfeiting really, really is a major threat to the growth of the business. Not, it's just bad, all in all because it's a threat to public health. Some of these products are either substandard or they don't contain anything at all, they are fake. Okay? The way it also hurts the industry is that they are labeled as having come from multinational companies. And uh, because they are counterfeit, the prices are very low. Now, when uh, somebody in the public who may not be discerning goes into a pharmacy and sees that, wow, this comes from uh, a multinational manufacturer and it's much cheaper than from a local manufacturer. The tendency will be to buy that one. And it's fake and uh, it's counterfeit and substandard. Some medicines were randomly picked from the market and they contained very little percentage of the active ingredient, sometimes even less than 10% of the active ingredient, where the standards are supposed to be 95%, 99%. I mean, it's just damaging to business and at the same time to patients. I mean, who knows? Who will be the next person to take a counterfeit drug which will kill him or her? You know, uh, it's a real issue in this country. More and more marketers of fake products go to the rural areas, they go to places where they know that their nefarious activities might take a long time to be uncovered. By that time, maybe they will made, they have made their money and they're gone. When there is the demand for medicines and the availability is low, that leaves a space now for the counterfeiters and the fake medicines producers to come in. So it is very important that the local manufacturers fill the gap. I mean, our first point of marketing is to invite the professionals to visit their facility. Once you've seen our establishment, you have nothing to doubt when we tell you uh, about the quality or efficacy of our products. We were lucky to get a, a group of investors from Tunisia. Honestly, if they didn't come in, who knows? Maybe we wouldn't have gotten any investments at all. But at the end of the day, they're still financial people. And so what they want to see is the bottom line. And they may not be as patient as we would be. So I wish I'd won the lottery in Chicago and you know, I had all the millions to put in and, and, and not have to get investors in. Uh, because then we would have ha been able to guide the company the way we wanted to go. 
with that idealism, with that passion, which is what is required. You do need to have the passion. If you are uh, the founder promoter, it's like your your own baby, and um, uh, so s uh, um, you, there is a, a rational aspect and an emotional aspect. Uh, from an investor point of view, um, uh, you only look at the rational aspect. Obviously, we didn't, we never expected to reach break even the first year or the second year, but um, uh, now we are at our fourth year of investment, and um, and so. Um, uh, at some point you say, okay, what are we doing wrong? Why are we not there yet? How can we accelerate things? And that's where um, uh, you may have to uh, change a little bit your strategy and, uh, uh, and the way you do things to accelerate that. And, um, and so we may have had differences of opinion in what the priorities are. You see, we got to a time in Lagre that you couldn't even see your future. You couldn't even see above the position that you had because then investors come in and fill all those managerial positions, which also served as a more of a demotivating factor for some of us. That how do you move up? There is no promotion for you in the next five years or four years. So it is something that it is very dear to my heart that we not just set this up to set a standard, but we also pass this on to the next generation. If we don't do that, we've failed. This business requires um, a, a lot of um, um, uh, highly skilled um, uh, personnel. Um, and obviously, uh, so the, the break-even point um, uh, is, uh, could be relatively high. To reach break-even you need a minimum amount of monthly turnover. We're very confident that we're going to reach that monthly level uh, this year which will allow the company to be self-sustainable from a cash flow perspective. If so, the company will stop uh, burning cash uh, by the end of this year. And uh, we will continue our support to this company. So that is the stage we are, where we are building up uh, to the structures. Um, maybe in the future trying to expand our facility, bring in other lines like liquid lines and other things that we don't have. And when you get it all right, with the quality that is coming out, uh, products getting accepted, volumes increasing, then the profits will come. If your goal is only about prof profit, then probably Lagre La shouldn't be here today. If the goal is all about profit, you know, you really don't have to make a lot of money in the healthcare business. You really need to be able to make a difference in the life of people. Once you are sustainable, once you've got enough profits to keep the company going, do you really have to rake in, you know, tons of millions of dollars? No, we, we don't believe that. We look at the population, uh, how many people are we going to impact, how many kids are we going to impact with this. All of those are taken into consideration before we decide that we're going to go along with, with the product. Profit is what now you use to grow the, the operation, you use to grow, grow the company. So it's very important to work out the numbers, make sure that there's a profit at the end, which now can be used to sustain and to grow the business. There ought to be a certain significant margin of profit, otherwise you don't have a business.